If you want to get the best out of your camera, you need to understand exposure. And exposure is comprised of three critical elements that we refer to as the exposure triangle. And that's aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Let's talk about those now. These three elements, which we also refer to as exposure variables, are critical to understand because they're part of the fundamentals of photography. And the reason why you need to understand them is because each variable will have a direct impact on not only your exposure, but also the final look and feel of your image. So let's go ahead and discuss each one of these variables and the order in which we're going to cover them is going to be the same order as how the light enters into your camera. First, we're going to talk about aperture because it's part of your lens and the lens is what receives the light. Then we're going to talk about shutter speed and the last topic is going to be ISO. Now, aperture is really easy to understand if you associate it with your eyes. And that's because lenses were made to resemble how our eyes work. There is that front element that receives the light, just like your cornea. Then your cornea bends the light and passes it to the iris. Now, the iris, depending on how much light there is available, it will either shrink or expand your pupil. And the size of the pupil is what controls the amount of light that goes into your eye. So think of aperture the same way. Its purpose is to do the same thing, is to control the amount of light that enters your camera. Aperture can be big or small, depending on what you set it to. If you set it to the largest size that the lens will allow, we call that wide open or maximum aperture. If you set it to the smallest size, we call that minimum aperture. So let's go back to that eye example. What happens when you're sitting in a really dim environment? Well, because there's not enough light, your eyes start to expand the iris, which then obviously expands the pupil. So more light comes in. Now, when you're outside and it's really, really bright, you'll find your, that your pupil is now going to be much smaller because it doesn't need all that light to go through. Now that you know what aperture is, let me show you how it actually looks like. So right here, I have a Zeiss 50 millimeter F2 manual focus lens. And the reason why I'm using a manual focus lens is because it's much easier to demonstrate. This is a 50 millimeter F2 lens. Now that F2 means its maximum aperture can be set to F2. So if you look at in front of this lens, you can see that right now it's wide open. Wide open meaning the most amount of light is passing through the lens at that F2 setting. Now watch what happens as I start turning that ring you can see that it's getting much smaller. And right here at its smallest hole, smallest opening, is I'm set to F22. And that F22 is the minimum aperture setting that this lens allows. So with this small of an aperture, if I wanted to get more light into my camera through my lens, I would simply have to open it up. Now, let's talk about F-stops or F-numbers. Now on that lens that I showed you, I talked about numbers like F2 and F22. And if you remember at F2, the lens was wide open, was letting a lot of light through. And when I made that aperture really, really small, I said that's F22, referring to the minimum aperture. Now it's strange that it sounds that F2 is actually a smaller number than F22, and yet F2 referred to the maximum opening versus smaller opening. Why is that? Now there's something called an f-stop or an f-number and that number refers to the size of the aperture. Now it's not the physical size of the aperture, it simply refers to how big it is relative to how much light passes through the lens into the camera. Now take a look at this chart and hopefully it will make it easier for you to understand the size of aperture relative to the f-number. You can see that we have it illustrated from f1.4 all the way to f8. Now at f1.4, that's the smallest number, but see how big that aperture looks? And now take a look at f8. That's really, really small. So that's something for you to keep in mind. Always, when you think about the f number, the larger the number, the smaller the aperture. The smaller the number, the larger the aperture. Now you can see in this chart, we go from f1.4 to f2, 2.8, f4, 5.6, and f8. Now that change in numbers going from say f1.4 to 2 or from 2.8 to 4 is one stop. The most important thing you need to understand now is that when you switch from say f1.4 to f2 or we just say when you stop down from f1.4 to f2, what you're doing is you're halving the amount of light that is getting through the lens into your camera.
Now, if you go from F2 back to F1.4, it's going to reverse the effect, and now you're going to basically double the amount of light that's passing through the lens into your camera. But there's something else that you need to keep in mind. Aperture doesn't just control how much light enters into your camera. It also affects the overall look of your image, the aesthetics. There are things like bokeh and depth of field that are also affected by the aperture, but we're going to talk about those later on in the video. So to wrap up, aperture is simply the opening of your lens that controls how much light passes through it into your camera. Let's talk about shutter speed now. Shutter speed is the second variable of the exposure triangle, and in addition to your lens's aperture, it's another great way to control the final look and feel of your images. So we're going to talk about both what your camera's shutter is, and also how shutter speed affects your exposure. So what is a shutter? A shutter is simply something that allows light through unless it hits your film or your sensor, or blocks light and doesn't let it through. So unlike an aperture, a shutter is always either open or closed. There's no halfway, there's no in between. It's either completely letting light through or completely blocking light. Now you can also imagine it's something like your eyelids. So they either close or open, and when they're closed, they don't let light hit your eyes. When they're open, you can see. So there's a few different types of shutters out there. There are electronic shutters, and those are found in cell phones and point and shoots and some mirrorless cameras. And there's also mechanical shutters, and those are found in pretty much all DSLRs and also some mirrorless. So right here, I've got a mirrorless camera, and it's got a mechanical shutter. So take a look at the shutter moving. You can actually see it moving across the sensor, and what it's doing is it's basically acting like a curtain, and it's called a curtain shutter and it's just opening and closing, letting light hit the sensor and blocking light from hitting the sensor. Now there's also leaf shutters and those are typically found in lenses, but they do the exact same thing. They either let light hit the sensor or keep it from hitting. So there's mechanical shutters, electronic shutters, they do the exact same thing, just in a different way. So now that you know what a shutter is, it should be very easy to understand what shutter speed is. Shutter speed is simply how long that your shutter stays open, exposing your sensor or your film to light. Now you can also affect the look of your images with shutter speed, and you can either imply motion or you can freeze motion. So let's talk about implied motion with shutter speed. Basically with that, if you use a slower shutter speed, anything that's moving in the frame is going to take on a more blurred look. So you've probably seen pictures of cars driving by where it looks like the wheels are spinning and you can tell that they were moving, that's done with a slow shutter speed. Also, if you've ever seen a photo of a waterfall and it looks nice, silky smooth, that's done with a slow shutter speed because the water is moving within the frame while everything else isn't. So you're getting that feel of motion. You can tell the water's cascading down and you're really getting a nice effect for your images with a slow shutter speed. On the other hand, a fast shutter speed is used to freeze action. So if you've seen photos of athletes that are obviously moving very, very fast, but everything is frozen and is very, very crisp, that's done with a fast shutter speed. There's also, it's, it's used quite a bit in nature photography. So say, for example, you have a bird taking off from a lake and there's drops of water that are frozen, the feathers are very visible, nothing is blurry, that's done with a fast shutter speed. So how is shutter speed measured? Well, if it's less than a second long, it's measured in a fraction of a second. And if it's longer than one second or just one second, it's simply measured in seconds. So if you have, say, a half second exposure, it's gonna be that fraction, one slash two or one over two, which is a half. So if it's, say, a tenth of a second, it's gonna be one slash 10, hundredth of a second is one slash 100, thousandth of a second is one slash 1,000. Now, if it's longer than a second, it's just gonna simply say a number. So it'll be one for one second, five for five seconds, or even up to 30, 30 seconds in most cameras. Now, one thing to note, on some cameras, it's not going to be able to show that fraction. So if you're shooting at one one hundredth of a second, you're not gonna see the one slash 100, you'll just simply see 100. And that's basically a space consideration. In the viewfinder on the LCD screen, there's just not enough room to write that one slash, so they simply will show 100. Now, if you're shooting at one second or longer shutter speeds, then you're gonna see a number with two little marks after it, and that just means seconds. So if you see a number with the marks after it, you're shooting in full seconds. If you don't see the little marks, you're shooting in fractions of a second. One last thing about shutter speed, it's the same thing as exposure time. And sometimes people will just say it and leave off the one, one over. So if you hear someone say, 
I'm exposing for a hundredth of a second or my exposure time is a hundredth of a second, they're really saying my shutter speed is set to one one hundredth of a second, but they don't say the one, they don't say shutter speed, they'll just say a hundredth of a second exposure. So just keep that in mind, it's the exact same thing. Let's now talk about the last variable of the exposure triangle, ISO. Now what is ISO? Basically, ISO is the property of your camera. Just like aperture is the property of the lens, ISO is always the property of the camera. So what does it do? How does it work? Before digital, if a film photographer wanted to switch from a really bright environment to a dim environment, the only choice to increase the sensitivity of film was to switch film from say ISO 100 film to ISO 800 film. So you can imagine how difficult things were when the photographer switched from a really bright environment to a darker environment they would either have to continue shooting with the low sensitivity film or switch to a higher sensitivity film sacrificing the previous roles. Now with digital, there is no problem. You can go from any ISO, from ISO 100 to 200, 400, 800 to any ISO and you don't have that problem. So what is ISO? Well, ISO is your digital camera sensor's sensitivity to light. Now I mentioned some numbers like ISO 100, 200, 400 and all you need to know about those is that the smaller the number, the lower the sensitivity of your digital camera sensor. The higher the number, the higher the sensitivity. If you remember from the previous discussion on aperture, I gave you an example of what happens to your pupil when you're in an indoor environment or outdoor environment when it's really bright, how it reduces in size or how it expands in size. Well, imagine being in a room that is really, really dim. And in that situation, obviously, your pupil is going to be wide open. And when that happens, you're absorbing as much light as possible, but you still can't see much because it's so dark. And it takes a while for your eyes to adjust, and then you start to see. Well, what's happening is, in this situation, basically, it's your retina in the back of the eye that's receiving the light. In the beginning, it starts out that's not really sensitive, and then it starts, your brain tells you, well, I can't see, so start adjusting that sensitivity. Then your retina starts adjusting that sensitivity, and you can see. Well, what happens then from, if you go from that dim environment to a really bright environment, all of a sudden you get this burning sensation and you can't see. Well, at that time, your eyes are so sensitive to light because they adjusted themselves in the dark environment, they increased the sensitivity, and now you went outside and all of a sudden, it's really bright. So those, that sensitivity is still the same, so that's why you get that burning sensation. And it will take a while for your eyes to readjust again so that you can see properly. So think of it the same way with ISO. If you have a lower ISO, you're less sensitive to light. If you have a higher ISO, you're more sensitive to light. Well, if your camera changes sensitivity levels, you might be wondering why not just keep a really high sensitivity level at all times? Well, just like in that example, when you're going from a dim environment to a really bright environment like right now, you're going to get that burning sensation. Well, with a camera, it's the same thing, except we call it overexposure. So increasing ISO to a high level in a really bright environment is going to have that effect. You're going to have some of the areas of the image that are going to start looking blown out, as we call it, or there's just too much light in there. But that's not the only thing that's happening when you increase ISO. As you push that ISO to really high numbers, you'll start seeing noise, you'll start losing dynamic range, and we'll talk about that later. You'll lose colors, and your images are going to have more of that muddy, dirty look to them. So just keep that in mind that the best thing you want to do in your camera is to keep your ISO as low as possible. There's something called base ISO, which is typical on cameras around ISO 100, and you want to keep it there as much as possible and only increase ISO when you absolutely have to. You'll also need to know that doubling ISO will also double sensitivity to light. So going, say, from ISO 100 to 200 double sensitivity. And as strange as it may sound, going from ISO 1600 to 3200 is the same. You're doubling the sensitivity to light. 
So ISO 3200 is basically double of ISO 1600. And although the range is so much bigger now, especially if you start pushing towards say ISO 6400, well the next one from there is ISO 12800, which is double of ISO 6400. So just keep that in mind. Once you start seeing those numbers, it might look strange that it goes 100, 200, and then 400, 800, and then just number keeps growing. There's now sensors that are able to capture images at ISO half a million. And the reason why they can do that, again, is not, it doesn't mean that it's so much greater. Once you start doubling up, the numbers become really large really quickly. One side note, especially for the techies out there, the technical definition of ISO that I gave is actually wrong when I was referencing sensitivity. Because digital camera sensors, they're not like film where you can replace them or if they don't have these varying levels of sensitivity. The sensitivity stays the same. But that's really not important because for you, we made this much easier by explaining insensitivity. Now, if you look at your camera, in many places, you'll actually see references to ISO sensitivity because everybody gets it. It's such an easy concept to understand. And if you really, really want to dig into the technical specifications and understand how these digital camera sensors work, you can go online and do some research, but it really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, all you need to know is ISO sensitivity and how it works in your camera. And that's really it. We set up a demonstration for you to show you what happens when you increase ISO from a lower value to a larger value and how that introduces noise and also deteriorates image quality. So to, since because today is such a bright day, we actually had to block some of the light that's going into the camera. So we use a neutral density filter. Now by doing that, we actually cut that light and at the same time increase the ISO a little bit. So right now the camera is set to ISO 400. But as you can see, I look good. The background behind me looks good. But let's see what happens when we push that ISO to a higher number. So right now from 400, we're going to go to 800, 1600, 3200, and now we're at 6400. Now take a look at what's happening around me. Right, there's a lot more noise in the background, but you can't really see that much. If you look at my face though, you should see that there is a little bit of pixelation happening. There is a little bit of noise here and there. But watch what happens now when we push that even further. So we're going to now double ISO from 6400 to 12,800. There is a lot more noise. And finally, 25,600. Now at 25,600, it's really obvious. All this noise around me in my face, so just keep this in mind. This is what's going to happen when you're going to push your ISO way too much. Now that we've discussed the three elements that make up the exposure triangle, there's one more thing we need to discuss before we can talk about how they work together, and that is a stop or a stop of light. Now this term stop is something that we're going to reference throughout all of our videos, and it's just a very common term in photography. So it's something that you really need to understand. So what is a stop? A stop is simply a way to measure light, but it's not a traditional measurement that you can easily quantify like a mile or a kilogram. Instead, a stop is just a way to measure light relative to the light that's already there. So you can measure a stop of light relative to an existing scene or your current exposure. Stops are traditionally measured in full stops of light. So you'll see one stop and that's a full stop but you'll also see two stops, three stops, or maybe minus one stop, minus two stops. What that represents is not just a difference in light, but it's an actual amount. So it's either one stop is twice as much light or minus one stop is half the light. That's very important to understand because it controls your entire exposure. So let's say we wanna change our exposure by one stop. Well, there's three different ways, at least as far as the exposure triangle is concerned, that we can do that. With your aperture, remember Nassim mentioned if you change your f-stop by one stop, so maybe going from f1.4 to f2, that's one stop of light, and you're decreasing the amount of light coming into your camera, you're cutting it in half by one stop. Now, with shutter speed, you can do the exact same thing, and that works by simply changing your shutter speed. So if you go from, say, 1 to 50th of a second to 1 500th of a second, you are letting in half the amount of light. So your shutter is only open for half the amount of time, therefore half the amount of light comes in, and that's one stop of light. Exact same thing with ISO. If you change your ISO from ISO 200 to ISO 400, you're in effect making your sensor more sensitive by one stop. So you're letting in or you're 
you're exposing for one more stop of light. So stops are very important, just don't forget, they represent a change. One stop is either twice as much light or half the amount of light. So how about a real world example? Let's say you're out photographing a landscape with a friend. Well, first off, as far as stops go, you'd never look at your friend and say, hey, how many stops are you shooting at? Or what's your stop set to? Like, that's just not a real thing. Like, that's not how stops work. Instead, let's say maybe the sun went behind a cloud and suddenly your scene got darker. Well, there you might say, oh, wow, the, the scene just changed by one stop. Well, that means you're gonna need to change your exposure by one stop and let in twice as much light to compensate for that change in the scene. So, to do that, there's three different things you could do as far as the exposure triangle goes. You can either change your aperture and open it up to let in more light. So let's say you're shooting at f8 for your aperture. Well, you'd need to go to f5.6 because that lets in twice as much light or one stop of light. If you didn't want to change your aperture, you could also change your, sh your shutter speed. So to do that, let's say you're shooting at 1 250th of a second. Well, you'd need to open the shutter for a longer amount of time, so you'd have to go one stop or change it to 1 1 25th of a second. That lets in twice as much light, one more stop of light. If you didn't want to do those, you could also change your ISO on your camera. So maybe you're shooting at ISO 100, you could always change it to ISO 200, which increases the sensitivity by one stop, thus giving you the proper exposure. So you can see that adjusting any of the three elements of the exposure triangle is a valid way to adjust your overall exposure. Now, we have a visual example for you that should hopefully solidify this concept in your mind and make it very easy for you to understand. We have this example set up to demonstrate how the three different elements of the exposure triangle work together and relate to each other. So, how do Play-Doh and measuring cups represent aperture, shutter speed, and ISO? Well, this Play-Doh is going to represent both aperture and shutter speed. So its diameter is going to represent the aperture or the opening in your lens that lets light pass through it. And its length is going to represent shutter speed or how long your sensor is exposed to light. These measuring cups are going to represent ISO. So they're basically what's going to gather the light or gather this Play-Doh. So we have a one cup, we have a half cup, and we have a quarter cup. Those numbers don't matter, but what does matter is that this half cup is half the size of this one cup, and this quarter cup is half the size of this half cup. So you can think of these as maybe being ISO 100, ISO 200, and ISO 400. Now you might have seen something similar done with water and buckets instead of measuring cups and Play-Doh, but in just a minute I think you'll see why the Play-Doh works a little bit better. So to start out, let's just talk about aperture and shutter speed. For now, don't worry about ISO. We'll get to that in just a minute. So as I said, this represents my aperture and my shutter speed. So for example, let's say this is f5.6 and this is a shutter speed of 1 250th of a second, just like in the landscape example. Well, let's say I want to change my aperture to f8. That means I'm going to make it smaller, so I let in half the amount of light. Well, let's go ahead. Oop, get this a bit longer here. So it's not perfect. Your aperture is going to look a lot better, but you get the idea. So this is going to be about half the size of this, our original aperture. But look at the length. You can see that now it's about twice as long, okay? So by being twice as long, you need twice the exposure because you have a smaller aperture and you're letting in half of the light. So by doubling my exposure time, my shutter speed has changed from 1 250th of a second to 1 1 25th of a second. So in that landscape example, we lost a stop of light and we were shooting at ISO 100. Let's see how ISO plays into this. Now we know that regardless of what our aperture and shutter speed are, whether it's 5.6 and 1 250th of a second, or f8 and 1 1 25th of a second, we've got the same amount of light here. So as far as ISO goes, if we were shooting at ISO 100 and the light changed by a stop, let's see what happens. This, when you go in, it doesn't fill it up. It just doesn't fit in here. So if we change our ISO to ISO 200, for example, you can see it fits in there perfectly. So ISO 200 gives us the proper exposure, granted that our shutter speed and our aperture are set where they need to be. So 
you can see as far as ISO, shutter speed, and aperture are concerned, they all work together and in this example when the cup is filled, we have the proper exposure. So you can see if I'm shooting at an aperture of f5.6 and the shutter speed of 1 250th of a second, or if I'm shooting at an aperture of f8 and a shutter speed of 1 125th of a second, either way, ISO 200 for this theoretical exposure is the correct ISO to get the proper exposure. If I take this amount of light, it's the same amount regardless of what the settings are, ISO 100 just doesn't work. And if I change to ISO 400, well, you can see it's obviously too much, it's overexposed. So this is underexposed, this is overexposed, this is the correct exposure. So let's say we want to shoot at ISO 100. Well, that means if ISO 200 is our proper exposure, then we need to double the amount of light to be able to shoot at ISO 100. So if we take both of these, um, it could, you know, your settings are going to vary, but both of these are going to fit in here and we're going to have a proper exposure at ISO 100. So again, with double the amount of light we had before, this is going to overexpose if we're shooting at ISO 200, it's just too much, and you don't even want to go to ISO 400, you know that is going to be way too much light. So just remember, all three work together, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, and any combination of them will give you an exposure, but it has to be relative. It has to be, you know, if one changes and gets decreased, another has to increase in order to maintain the same exposure. So since we have all this Play-Doh, I think we should do a few more examples for you. So let's talk again about how the relationship between aperture and shutter speed works. But instead of making a smaller aperture, let's go ahead and make it bigger. So what I'm going to do is make this aperture bigger just by smashing this down. So that's pretty good. That should be about half the size of this. So we have gone from f5.6 to f4. So you can see it's a bigger opening, but what's that do to our shutter speed? Well, it's thinner. It's, it's a shorter amount of exposure that we have. So our shutter speed is going to have to be faster in order to let in this greater amount of light and get the same exposure. So if this was an aperture of f5.6 and shutter speed of 1 250th of a second, we have made this one twice as big to let in twice the amount of light. So it's an aperture of f4, but the shutter speed has to be half the amount of time. So it's an, a shutter speed of 1 500th of a second. Now, we know from ISO that as long as this is the same amount as this and as this was, it's still not enough to fill ISO 100. So for our previous example, ISO 200 is still the proper exposure regardless of what this looks like. So let's talk about what happens if you change one variable and not the other. So I've got right here the same exact ex uh, amount of light. So we have aperture 5.6, shutter speed of 250th of a second. Well, what happens if I cut my shutter speed in half? Well, right now I've got two pieces here. In effect, we still have an aperture of f5.6, but we have a shutter speed of just uh, 1 500th of a second because it's half as long. So it went from 1 to 50th of a second to 1 500th of a second. Since I cut my light in half by changing my shutter speed, that means that my original ISO of 200, which works for this amount of light, won't work for half the light. Instead, I need to change my ISO to 400, and it should give me a proper exposure. And look at that. Perfect. So hopefully you know by now that no matter what I do to this, if I make it a really, really wide aperture, but a really, really fast shutter speed, or maybe I make it a really long shutter speed and a really small aperture, it's the same amount of light. And we know that for this amount of light, ISO 400 is pretty much our only option for a correct exposure. So how does this relate to stops, which we discussed earlier? Well, if you remember, a stop is just a way to measure a, an amount of light. So if you increase by a stop, you are doubling the amount of light. And if you decrease by a stop, you are cutting the amount of light in half. So for this example, we know that this and this, even though they're different apertures and shutter speeds, it's the same amount of light. And we also know that ISO 200 is the proper ISO for this amount of light. But that means if we put this into ISO 100, it's not enough. We actually need two of them to make the proper exposure with ISO 100. So 
that stop, that mean, or that change in stops from ISO 200 to 100 is a one stop difference because it's twice as much light. Well, let's look at what happens when we look at ISO 400. If you remember with ISO 400, we took our amount of light and cut it in half. So it went from ISO 200 to 400, which is a one stop change or half the light. But what happens when we go from ISO 400 to ISO 100? We don't need two of these to fill it because we know that will fill ISO 200. We actually need four of these to fill ISO 100. So that means that changing from ISO 400 to 200 is one stop. ISO 200 to 100 is one stop, but it's not twice the amount of light, it's four times the amount of light going from ISO 400 to 100. So a two stop change is actually four times the amount of light, and that's pretty much it for stops. So I hope this demonstration was helpful for you in really pointing out how aperture, shutter speed, and ISO all work together and how they're related in terms of exposure.